By the grace of Christ, my brethren, let us read today from uh, the book of Zephaniah. Sorry, the book of Haggai. Zephaniah, Zephaniah the prophet. Chapter 3, the last chapter, and verse 14. The prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 14. By the grace of our Lord. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Jer or Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgment. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst you shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will bring you back even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord God. Amen. Zephaniah the prophet, which his name means protection by God. He is living in a time of iniquity, of transgression and idolatry, of judgment of God, of affliction and misery of the people of God. But in his prophetic word, what matters is how does he end? He ends with a message that is joyful, a message of blessing a message, message of joy and glory of God. And someone would say that it is completely unexcused, inexcusable, especially for the time that he brings this message and because of the things that are happening around him, the things that he sees, the things that he hears. But the message that he brings is not of man, it is heavenly. It is by the Holy Spirit, and out of this, it is completely true. A message of joy, of happiness, of glorification, a message completely joyful in a period that is bad, and in a time, in a point of time, Because of unbelief and disobedience, I would dare characterize the expression tragic and far from God. But when God speaks, on one hand, he says the absolute truth. On the other hand, the truth that he expresses is absolutely justified. He doesn't say things out in the air and we just believe them and doubt them. He says things that are specific, and he explains the reason why. So he brings a joyful message by explaining the reason why, and because it is a word of the Old Testament, and for us this is a teaching onto training and restoration. For that reason, it is very important for us to understand 
what happened, what is happening, what this thing that the Word of God is describing is, so that in the absolute suffering because of sin, God then bring absolutely a, an absolute joyful message. And as I said before, and I repeat, the message of God is always absolutely justified. It is not a message just in the air without any gravity. It is very justified. So it is very important for us to understand from where it came and why did God express a joyful message in evil times. And it is even more important to us because the truth is that we as Greece and as a church are experiencing very evil times without there being hope in the end of the tunnel that things will be corrected. But rather we see the opposite, somebody would say. So it is very important to see when and why God brings joyful messages there where there is no hope. There where there's no light, as people say at the end of the tunnel. There where nobody sees the least light. Let us read it and may God give us understanding of it so we can see how important the Word of God is for us. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Rejoice, be glad, sing, for the Lord has taken away your judgments and has cast out your enemy. He has taken your affliction and he has driven away your enemy. Why? The King of Israel is the Lord in your midst. For that reason, you shall see disaster no more. When? Because the Lord became, is your king in your midst, you will never see evil. You will only see good. If, in other words, God is telling us, we make the steadfast decision in our heart, Trusting the Word of God, which is divinely inspired and without error. That is unique. And just as Abraham, we then believe in the Word of God in hope, without seeing in our weakness and our affliction, but listening today to the Word of God, that we believe with hope, that God who gives us this word today is able to do it and everyone who, who will believe it. He's able. It is not by chance ever when God speaks to us. It's never by chance. God sees, God knows, God understands, God hears prayers, God sees our needs and He comes and He gives us a message of correction and indeed of such a correction that the result of it will be absolutely joyful and blessed within a time of affliction. When the Lord becomes your king in your midst, then you will see disaster no more. If you make the Lord your king, you will see no disaster no more. What does king mean and how will I make him my king? I want the Lord to be king in my soul, in my life, and in my heart, in my family, in my environment, so that I may have these joyful news. What does king mean? Absolute ruler. The king of that time was an absolute ruler. He had absolute authority to govern, to enslave, to deliver, to rule, to determine who were friends and who were foes to explain, to inform, to do whatever he wants without asking anyone, to praise and to punish, to judge and to convict, but also to take care and nourish, 
to exalt and to humiliate, but the most important, to give pardon and to set free the person who is not worthy of it. Only the king had the right to give pardon, only the king. Nor the generals, nor the rulers, only the king had the right to give pardon to the condemned. So, my dear brothers and sisters, it is very, very, very important for us to think for us who Jesus Christ is. What is he? I say it simply. Is he simply the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Or is he mine? And when I say mine, I say this that everyone think of himself as this is my king. Have I accepted him as my king? Have I accepted him as absolute ruler and master? Have I ac accepted his righteousness and accepted every work of his? And I say, I glorify you and praise you because you are a special king because you love me? Not only do I accept you as a king, but I trust you as my Lord and my God and as my great high priest. I do not complain. The king does whatever he wants. I do not whine because the king does whatever he wants. I do not become indignant because my king, I want him to do whatever he wants in my life. That is the king, my king. He will command me, and I will say amen. He will convict me, and I will say amen, amen again. He will judge me, and if it is necessary, he will condemn me, and I will say amen. He will praise me, and if it be necessary, and, and then I will say glory be to you. And from him, especially my dear brethren, I expect him to give grace to every detail of my life because only he can, only he is willing, and only him do I accept as my king. That is my king. Today we will all leave with our king in our heart, my brethren, our personal king. You know what it means for you to be in a kingdom and to know the king personally? Is that possible? You dwell in a kingdom and you say, the king of this kingdom is my friend. He's my king, but I am also his. I belong to him completely. He reigns in my life. He, I want him to reign in my life. I want he to rule in my family. I want he to reign in my going in and coming out. I do not want to be anything more than a humble servant of my own king. Not the king of other men. I don't want other kings. Neither men, because we can make kings that are men. We can make kings that are make, make my king a man and even myself or my child or my grandchild. I can turn into a king. That is, he can do whatever he wants in my life. No, today we condemn this thing in the name of Christ. The one who will now and forever be king, he will be your king, our king, as individuals, as families, and as a church, and that is one. That is Jesus Christ. We don't want anyone else. We do not accept anyone else. And because we believe in his word, we trust his word, because to those who believe the scripture says there is honor, to those who, who do not believe there's judgment and condemnation. We believe, we believe. We believe in his word, and we enjoy the honor of having our king and our Lord and our prince, one person that is unique, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. And we don't want anyone else. And because in grace in our life, we expect only from Him. We do not expect grace from men. We do not expect grace from anyone, only from our King. He rules in our life. And the Word of God says, during that day, when you will understand that as king, when you will accept that your king in your midst is the Lord, then it will be spoken to you, do not fear, let your hands not be shaken, even if you are justly captured, even if you're afflic afflicted rightfully. Fear not, let your hands not be shaken, because the Lord your God, your King in your midst, is mighty. He will save you, and He will rejoice with your gladness, and He will be quiet in your love, and He will rejoice with your singing. Remember, the joy of God in Edom was with, for Him to meet Adam and Eve and to talk with Him. The joy of our King is for Him to come with understanding that we belong to Him, with understanding. His understanding, He knows very well that we are reliable servants and we are absolutely submitted and we say amen to whatever He says. May your will be done according to your will. I have no opinion. I won't listen to men. I don't want anything else. I only want you to reign in my life. And David, knowing this, I looked at this, I looked this up and I was so happy. Knowing these things that I say, we're saying now, says the Lord reigns. When the Lord reigns, clothed in majesty, he is clothed in power and adorned in authority girded with authority when he reigns because he may be a king and not reign you know what it means for him to be king and not reign over you when the king reigns then he is clothed in majesty he is clothed in his power and girded with all his authority the important thing is does he reign over you or not that is the critical question he wants. Are you willing? And if you still cannot, you must ask from him. Lord, I want to have one king and that king to be you. I don't want anything else. I would dare say, but I say it with, how can I say, with sincerity and with faith. I would dare say, Lord, I don't want anything else. I only want you to reign in my life. But I say, if this does not happen, if this happens, then I have everything. If, in other words, you do truly reign in my life, then I will lack nothing. I will see no evil in my life. Why? Because he has decided, because he rejoices with my joy, he rejoices with my love, he rejoices with my praise, he is able to assemble all those who are sad, all those who are of you, to whom its reproach was a great burden. He will gather all of yours, all mine, all of your people, all of my people, all without any exception. And where will he gather them? So that he may glorify, they may glorify and the appointed assembly, so that you may worship the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who is your Lord, your God, and your King. Behold, at that time when he will reign in your life, I will deal with all who afflict you, and I will save the lame that cannot walk well, that always falls and stumbles, but also those who are driven out who have been taken captive righteously, those who are driven out and lame, I will appoint them for praise and bring them in for my appointed assemblies. And I will make them, those who are exiled, those who are lame, 
those who are shamed, I will make them the fame and praise among all peoples in a, time, in a place of shame. You know something, my dear brethren, many times in our life there are places of shame. I'm ashamed to go to my family. I'm ashamed to go to my neighborhood. I'm ashamed to go. Why? Because I've messed up everything. Because it's my fault. Today, make the Lord your king. Upon the word of the Lord, make him your king. And there where you're ashamed, are you ashamed? Yes. There where you're ashamed, God will make you praise and glory in the time and the place of your shame. Praise and glory. Why? Because today we're making a, an astounding decision, a unique decision. I do not want anyone else to reign in my life except Christ, and I accept him. I want him to be my king, and I rejoice if he's my king. And for that reason, I expect grace only from my king. But I am also absolutely obedient and submitted to whatever he decides, to whatever he does, to whatever he says, and whatever he wants. So help me, Lord. Help me, Father, that I may be the way that you say in your word so that there may be this joyful message in my personal and family life. It is a message of salvation and glory. It is a message that is true because it is a message of the word of God. It is a message that nobody can doubt and nobody can postpone it or change it. It is not a hope that is postponed but it is a confirmation of things that are not seen. It is faith in the Word of God. In that time even, when Christ will be your king, and for however long Christ will be king, I will bring you, and I will gather you, and I will make you all praised and trustworthy among all the people, when I, your king, send away your captivity from before your eyes. I, your captivity, I will take it away and you will see it. And then I will change your shame to glory, your sorrow to joy, your affliction to blessing. Today, my dear brothers, and sisters, I plead with you in the name of Christ, all of us. Let us ask for Christ to be the only one, the eternal, the almighty, the eternal king of our life. I want to have a king. I believe in the ruling kingdom of the kingdom of heaven. I want to have a king. I want a king who is one, Christ. I want my king, him to be my king and to belong to him completely. I have no, I ex accept anything that he does in my life and whatever he does in my life. I praise him, I thank him because I know that from now on that I've made the decision to accept Jesus Christ to reign in my life. Listen to what David says. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. Those who sit, uh, him who sits in cherubs, let the earth shake before him. The Lord is great in Zion over all nations as the Almighty. He established the world and the world will not be shaken. So this is who the unshakable will be, the immovable servant of God, the one who chooses today chooses grace from God that he may be the one who truly has accepted Jesus Christ into his life as his king. The one. I want to be this one. And you also. I pray that you are one of those. But we have one king. One king. Jesus Christ. And he reigns over all our life and all the details of our life 
and all things without any complaint, without whinging, without second thoughts, without third thoughts, without anything disturbing my perfect relationship of a king with a servant. Servant with a king. May God help us, my dear brethren, because a perfect change will come. Politicians say, change now. But Christ says, from this moment on, I will do new things. I will change everything. Not without excuse. Not just because I thought of it, but with the excuse that is written in my word. Because you have made the decision today for Jesus Christ to be your king. Amen.